We've all heard the playful chimes of oranges and lemons, but beneath its cheerful tune lies a dark and twisted history, rooted in London's past. From executions to the city's iconic churches, this seemingly innocent rhyme is filled with hidden meaning. Join me as we uncover the dark secrets behind these familiar verses and reveal the gruesome mysteries lurking within. Welcome back, Darklings. Before we delve into its dark secrets, let's revisit the most well-known version of the rhyme. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me five farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey. When I grow rich, say the bells of Shoreditch. When will that be, say the bells of Stepney. I do not know, says the great bell of Bow. Here comes a candle to light you to bed, and here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Chip, chop, chip, chop, the last man is dead. It's a fascinating rhyme, first written down in 1744, yet filled with clues suggesting a much older origin. The last lines are particularly chilling, but before we dive into their gruesome history, let's examine what all those bells symbolize. Historically, Religion was at the heart of daily life, with churches serving as pillars of the community. A person's identity was deeply tied to their local church, which hosted major life events and acted as hubs for gatherings, news and education. As early as the 12th century, the one square mile area of the City of London contained 126 churches. Fast forward to the 15th century, and nearly two-thirds of the city was dominated by churches and monastic institutions, each with its own bells. The sound of all these bells chiming multiple times a day would have filled the city, becoming a defining feature of London life. Many of London's churches were grand, imposing structures that also served as vital landmarks, helping people navigate the city. The rhyme seems to tell the story of someone taking fruit without paying and being questioned about it but its lyrics also reference various London churches and the trades or activities linked to their surrounding areas. For example, Oranges and Lemons Say the Bells of St Clement's likely refers to St Clement Eastcheap, a church located on Clement's Lane near London Bridge and the River Thames. This area was historically a bustling hub where ships brought in fresh produce to be sold at the nearby markets. Cheap is derived from the Anglo-Saxon word for market. While a church has stood on this site since 1028, the current St. Clement's was rebuilt after the Great Fire of London in 1666. You owe me five farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's, likely refers to one of the several churches dedicated to St. Martin in medieval London. The most probable is St. Martin Orgar, which once stood on Martin Lane. During this time, Martin Lane was known for financial activities, including money lending and pawn brokering. This early form of financial services was primarily carried out by the Jewish community, making the line about owing money fitting for the area. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey, likely refers not to the famous courthouse we think of today, but to the street it's named after. The courthouse was built long after the Great Fire of London, but the site was originally home to the notorious Newgate Prison, dating back to the 12th century. Newgate was infamous for its horrific conditions, where filth was so rampant that the floors were said to crunch underfoot from lice and bedbugs. Across from Old Bailey is St Sepulchre without Newgate, a church with origins that go back before 1066. The area was also near Fleet Prison, built in 1197, where debtors were held. When I grow rich, say the bells of Shoreditch, could refer to the area where England's first purpose-built playhouse was erected in 1576. The associated church would be St Leonard's, whose crypt is the final resting place for many actors from the Tudor period. However, in the rhyme's original 1744 publication in Tommy Thumb's Pretty Songbook, the reference is to Fleet Ditch, not Shoreditch. Fleet Ditch was the lower stretch of the River Fleet, which flowed from Hampstead down into the Thames. The area around the river was notorious for its filth and crime, with the river itself serving as an open sewer, filled with waste and offcuts from the nearby meat markets. It was a haven for rogues, pickpockets and prostitutes. Charles Dickens later chose this grim part of London as the setting for Fagin's Den in Oliver Twist. 
In this context, the bells likely refer to St Bride's Church on Fleet Street, near the squalid banks of the River Fleet. A church has stood here since the 6th century, with the current building designed by Sir Christopher Wren in 1672. Wren also built a nearby pub for the church builders, aptly named the Old Bell. The original version of the Oranges and Lemons rhyme also includes some additional verses, so let's take a quick detour to explore those. Two sticks and an apple, say the bells at Whitechapel. Whitechapel takes its name from St Mary Matfalan Church, built in the 14th century and originally painted white, but destroyed during World War II. The line, two sticks and an apple, likely refers to bell making. The two sticks represent the wooden frame or yoke that holds and swings a bell while the apple symbolises the clapper inside that strikes the bell to produce sound. English bell ringing evolved dramatically after Henry VIII established the Church of England in the 16th century. Bell ringers discovered that by holding bells in an upright position, they could precisely control their timing, which enabled them to create intricate ringing patterns called methods. These complex sequences were unique to English churches, so foreign visitors to 16th century London would have been awestruck by a soundscape unlike any other city on earth. Remarkably, some church bells in England have been in use for nearly a thousand years, meaning that modern listeners are often hearing the exact same sounds as people centuries ago. Whitechapel was home to the famous Whitechapel Bell Foundry, established in 1570, though its lineage of bell founders traces back to 1420. The foundry produced some of the world's most iconic bells, including Big Ben and the Liberty Bell. Sadly, after centuries of operation, the Whitechapel Bell Foundry closed its doors in 2017, marking the end of an era. This historic connection to bell making makes Whitechapel's inclusion in the rhyme all the more fitting. Old Father Baldpate, say the bells at Aldgate. Aldgate was one of seven gatehouses in London's old city walls. Nearby stood a priory founded by Queen Matilda in 1108, where monks, known for their shaved heads, resided. This likely inspired the phrase Old Father Baldpate, with pate meaning the top of the head, a term dating back to the 14th century. The priory was dissolved by Henry VIII in 1532, and today the site is occupied by Aldgate School. Maids in white aprons, say the bells of St Catherine's, could refer to the Guild Church of St Catherine Cree, founded in 1280 near Leadenhall Market, where women market traders in white aprons sold meat, fish and poultry. Alternatively, it may reference St Catherine's Hospital, established in 1147 as a religious and medical institution. The hospital, with its collegiate church, was an important community hub, with bells marking prayer and services. The maids in white aprons in this case would refer to the hospital's nurses. St Catherine's Hospital operated until 1825, when it was demolished to make way for the St Catherine docks. When will that be, say the bells of Stepney? St Dunstan's Stepney, an Anglican church, has been a site of Christian worship for over a thousand years and was a vital church for mariners. It's one of London's oldest churches, and the phrase, when will that be, may reflect the longing of loved ones waiting for their sailor husbands or sons to return from sea, as Stepney was historically a hub for seafarers and shipbuilders. I do not know, says the great bell at Bow. St Mary Le Bow, located on Cheapside, was first mentioned in 1469 and is famous for its curfew bell, which rang every evening at nine o'clock. When the bell tolled, the city gates were closed and the streets of medieval London became dark and dangerous. Anyone out after curfew was required to carry a lit torch, and those found without one were presumed to be up to no good. The watchman would arrest anyone without a light, jailing them until dawn. And now, we finally arrive at those gruesome last lines. Here comes a candle to light you to bed, and here comes a chopper to chop off your head. At one time, over 200 crimes were punishable by death in England, many of them quite bizarre. These included offences like writing a threatening letter, associating with gypsies for a month, and even stealing from a rabbit warren. While hanging was the most common form of execution, beheading was typically reserved for nobles or those convicted of high treason. 
Given that the rhyme centres around the Bells of London, it's fitting that in medieval times, condemned prisoners were awoken the night before their execution by the tolling of a handbell rung outside their cell. This very bell, still housed in St Sepulchre without Newgate, was accompanied by a haunting rhyme warning the prisoners of their fate. All ye that in the condemned hole do lie, prepare you, for tomorrow you shall die. Watch all and pray, the hour is drawing near, that you before the Almighty must appear. Examine well yourself, in time repent, that you may not to eternal flames be sent. And when St. Sepulchre's bell in the morning tolls, the Lord above have mercy on your soul. The following morning, as the condemned were loaded onto a cart for their journey to the execution site, the bells of St. Sepulchre would toll, marking the grim occasion. Beheading was actually the final stage of punishment for those convicted of treason, who suffered one of the most brutal execution methods in history, hanging, drawing and quartering. After enduring being hung by the neck until almost dead, castrated and disemboweled, the final act was being cut into pieces and beheaded. The original London Bridge became infamous for displaying the severed heads of traitors, which makes it particularly interesting that the children's game associated with oranges and lemons is nearly identical to the one played to the London Bridge rhyme. There's even evidence that this game was played in medieval times, reinforcing the eerie connection between both these rhymes and London's history of executions. However, the last two lines of oranges and lemons, with their different rhythm, don't appear in earlier recorded versions of the rhyme. These lines were first documented by James Orchard Halliwell in the 1840s, who claimed to have collected them from oral tradition. Our modern version of the rhyme presents a clear narrative. Someone steals fruit, fails to pay, and is eventually executed. However, as we've seen, the earliest recorded version contained additional verses that don't align with this narrative. In fact, Many recorded variations list even more London churches, along with the trades or activities associated with those areas, but they have no connection to the fruit-stealing theme. This may mean that the rhyme was originally more about remembering London's geography than telling a gruesome story. It could have acted as a map for London's largely illiterate population, helping them remember the city's layout by linking specific churches to their local activities and events. But what do you think? Were these chilling lines part of the original rhyme, or were they added later to give it a gruesome storyline? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and if your thirst for nursery rhyme origins still lingers, don't forget to subscribe and explore the rest of my channel. See you in a future video.